Live from KSAT 12, the 6 o'clock news starts right now. A new year with newfound grief for two local families. We have now learned the names of two men killed in a high-speed crash last Thursday on the northwest side. 19-year-old Justin Tago, the driver, and 25-year-old passenger Mondo Lerma. Lerma had just celebrated his birthday. Today, his sister spoke to our RJ Marquez about his life and the impact he had on those around him. My heart just dropped. I never thought that like this would happen. Dea Lerma and Helena Carter say their family has not come to grips with the loss of their brother Mondo. I've been grieving, you know, but um, for my mom, we're trying to stay strong. It hasn't hit me, I think, until after this is over. Lerma was riding in a car last Thursday morning when police say the driver lost control, went into the opposite lanes, hit a brush pile, and slammed into a tree off Braun Road. Lerma and the driver, Justin Theo, were pronounced dead at the scene. He was just such a good person. You know, uh, he was the sweetest person ever. Like, he loved everybody around him so much. He could light up a room in two seconds. His family says Lerma was quiet, shy, and very smart. He had just celebrated his birthday on December 17th, and they were together on Christmas. It's like a blessing because we didn't know that would be our last. But looking back, it's like, thank God we got those last few moments with him. Helena and Dea have been overwhelmed by the support and messages they have received for their brother since news spread of his death. He would just want people to know what kind of person he truly was and just would want us to share his life. And, you know, Mondo lived every day to the fullest. It gives our family comfort knowing that how loved he was. And um, so we want to thank everyone for that. And since the crash happened, Mondo's family and friends have created this roadside memorial behind me at the site of the crash to honor their brother and son. They tell us that his services will be held later this week in Seguin. Reporting from the Northwest side, RJ Marquez, KSAT 12 News. Four months after Michelle Barrientos Vela was convicted of tampering with records, her defense team set out today to convince a judge that she's a good person who does not deserve to spend a decade in prison. Dylan Collier joins us live outside the Bear County Justice Center now. Dylan, how's that task been going so far? Well, Steve, they're more than halfway home. We'll have to see how the judge decides to go tomorrow. Barrientos Vela's former boss, her co-workers, and even her sister-in-law all described her as caring today, only to then have the prosecution come in and get those same witnesses to concede that some of her actions, like falsifying government records, weren't so good. The defense in this case moved through these character witnesses at a rapid pace, which was a nice change from what we've seen in this trial last summer and into the fall. The defense could rest as soon as tomorrow morning. Each time a witness today would paint Barrientos Vela as a solid employee or loving mother, the prosecution would remind them of what took place while she was in public office. Uh, you said she was generous, so she would, she would pay for everybody? Yes. Would she pay for you? Yes. Was it in cash? Yes. I don't, I don't remember how she paid. Was it in car? I don't remember. Barrientos Vela faces between two years probation and 10 years in prison because she's indicated that she will appeal her felony convictions. She will be allowed to remain free even if she's given a harsh sentence. Judge Velia Mesa is expected to issue that sentence, whether it's probation or prison, tomorrow after the defense's last character witness and closing arguments from both sides. Reporting live downtown, Dylan Collier, KSAT 12 News. We'll see what tomorrow brings. Thank you, Dylan. Medina Lake is not the only thing drying up. Right now, the reservoir is just over 6% full, and people living there say they've seen wells having issues, too. Our Garrett Berger talked with one man who's now trying to help out. This is not David Cahill's normal job, but it's one that needs doing. A home remodeler by trade, Cahill has found himself also delivering water to people whose wells are running dry, like those that his three properties did this spring. What he charges covers his costs, the slim profit to help pay the debt on his own deeper well he had to have dug for a little over 28 grand. But there's more to it than money. I don't like people hurting, so I want to help them if I can. I, if I didn't have, if I had all the money I needed, I'd be delivering water to people for free. Kale says that the thousand gallons can last his customers anywhere from about a week to about a month, depending on how much they use and the size of their family. Though he says most of his customers get deliveries about weekly. He's not the only one who has seen issues. The building owner of my business, sometimes they come up and get water from 
the restaurant for their property and they actually have waterfront property. This is happening as parts of the nearby reservoir look more like a sandbox. When the lake goes down, wells start drying up. There's that's definite, and I know from my three wells. But does the correlation mean causation? A U.S. Geological Survey official told us there isn't data to show if the surface water levels at Medina Lake affect the nearby groundwater levels. So right now, they simply can't say one way or the other. In either case, the delivered water is very much needed. They must have flushed the toilet. <laughs> at Medina Lake, I'm Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. San Antonio fire investigators sifting through the ashes for clues as to what sparked a house fire today. Those flames sending two people and their pets running from their home this morning. As Katrina Weber tells us, the fire also left a firefighter in need of some medical attention. Thick smoke continues to pour out of the second floor of a home in the 100 block of Tipperary Avenue long after a man and woman got out of it safely on their own. Firefighters who were called there by a neighbor just before nine this morning rushed in at first, trying to make headway on the fire. They say along with the smoke, they also initially found flames coming from a crowded bedroom. Crews had trouble moving around, then had to move out to fight the fire from outside. Eventually, they got the upper hand, but not before the fire damaged the entire upstairs area. While all people made it out safely, there was concern for a while about the family's pets, but firefighters say those two dogs were found and they're safe. During the battle, a firefighter suffered a minor injury, a dislocated finger. He got help for that at the scene. Family members, meanwhile, came to the help of the people who escaped the fire. Firefighters say most of the damage from it was contained to the second floor, but what they didn't know right away is how it started. Katrina Weber, KSAT 12 News. A lot of people all across the country waiting on any update about Bills player DeMar Hamlin after he collapsed on the field last night because of sudden cardiac arrest. At last check, he is still in critical condition. Courtney Friedman spoke to a doctor about similar cases and a local mother whose foundation offers free heart screenings in honor of her own son. After 24-year-old DeMar Hamlin took a hit to the chest last night during the Bills Bengals game, he collapsed. We now know due to sudden cardiac arrest. I didn't leave the TV. I couldn't leave until they stopped airing. That's because Doray Foodie lost her 18-year-old son August to sudden cardiac arrest in 2008. August had hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which is probably the rarest one. That's just one of many heart defects that can cause cardiac arrest without notice. They don't feel bad and suddenly one day their heart starts beating erratically. Dr. Alan Anderson is the head of cardiology at both University Hospital and UT Health San Antonio. He says there is another possible cause for a patient like Hamlin who was hit in the chest before his cardiac arrest. Called commotio cordis, and it is uh, a heart rhythm disturbance that arises from a sudden impact to the heart, usually by a flying projectile, typically a baseball or a hockey puck or a lacrosse ball. Dr. Anderson says the two most critical things when someone is in cardiac arrest is immediate CPR and then the use of a defibrillator, just like this one. But he also says prevention is key, and that means heart screenings. We screen for five different abnormalities that cause sudden death with no symptoms. After her son's death, Foodie created the August Heart Foundation, providing free screenings to any teenager in the area. This past year, I think we've tested uh, 7,800 and had 57 referrals just this year in, in 2022 alone. Leaving August a life-saving legacy. Courtney Friedman, KSAT 12 News. Now, if you would like to set up a free screening for your child, your sports team, or your school, head to augustheart.org, or you can call 210-267-2771. Check out traffic on this Tuesday. Let's go to I-10 at the Y near downtown, the fine silver building there, and you can see traffic moving along very smoothly as a lot of people head back to start their work week today. Well, considered a legend among cavers, Orion Knox Jr. discovered and explored caves around the world, yet he first gained fame for the cave he helped find that became the Natural Bridge Caverns, attracting millions of visitors since 1964. Orion Knox Jr. passed away over the weekend at the age of 81. Jesse Degoriato has this remembrance. You stay with the group behind you.
I mean, folks, we'll be continuing onward. If y'all will follow me, please. Every 10 minutes, there's another tour coming to see the underground wonders of Natural Bridge Caverns. They were undiscovered for millions of years until Orion Knox Jr. was the first of four St. Mary students in 1960 to squeeze through a narrow opening to enter the cave. It has to be scary when you're going in a place you don't know what's going to happen. But that's exactly why it said he did it. He just had that passion for exploration and discovery. Brad Weiss's family owned the ranch where Knox helped them develop Natural Bridge Caverns, now the largest show cave in Texas. Installing the pathways and handrails and lighting. While also continuing to explore and map a cave so large, where it ends, they say, is still unknown. Having learned of his passing, a visitor from Nepal paid tribute to Knox. I feel like his existence itself was like a miracle because, like, you know, he discovered this. He was a, a truly a uh, remarkable man. Knox's legacy, says Weist. Never stop exploring in life. Never stop making new discoveries. They say it's only fitting that Orion Knox Jr. chose Natural Bridge Caverns as his final resting place. He considered this one of his, his life's greatest accomplishments. Jesse De Goyado, KSAT 12 News. Gosh, we're all thankful for that discovery. I was gonna say, it's hard to argue I about know. that kind of a legacy. Beautiful. And it makes me wonder what else is out there we have yet to right. find. Well, just in that cave, uh -huh. they don't know how long it is, mm -hmm. so. Yeah. Unbelievable. Beautiful sunset out there this evening, and uh, we've got a few photos on KSAC Connect, and I'm just waiting for them to really keep filtering in. You can go to our Weather Authority app, and then a little camera icon on the bottom. You can share your photo of the beautiful sunset, and I'll have some of those for you coming up at uh, next half hour once we get more of them. 61 this morning, 79 the high temperature, right near 80 degrees. Get to Amarillo, 42, Lubbock at 52 and then 70s locally with in some 60s in the hill country. Uvalde now at 70, 69 New Braunfels, 64 in Catula, and temperatures will continue to drop pretty quickly here as the sky clears out, mostly clear, low humidity, and not much of a breeze out there right now. 60 degrees by 10 o'clock midnight, we're at 55. And have a sweatshirt or long sleeves ready for tomorrow morning. We'll be in the 40s to start the day. We'll talk about the temperature trend, how warm it gets this week, and our next cool front, which brings us a shot at rain this weekend. We'll talk more about that in just a bit. Welcome back, everybody. I'm Stefania Jimenez. Tonight on the Night Beat, we're going to discuss thousands of dollars in property stolen. But the person who took the stuff also left something behind. Who goes to steal a bunch of stuff from a house and takes the time to pee on the back porch first? Mm, that homeowner wants his stuff back, not the pee though, and how he hopes to help police track down the person responsible. Plus, at the end of the day, it's a question of when, not if. A new year brings migrants closer to a potential decision on Title 42. One immigration attorney weighs in on the policy's future and what he's expecting to happen next. We'll see you for these stories and so much more tonight on The Night Beat. Thank you, Stephanie. Let's take a live look with Sky 12 over San Fernando Cathedral, main plaza there. Still some Christmas lights up, mm -hmm. which I'm happy to see because mine are still very in our tree, very much up still. You bet. Same goes for my house, but a warm day to get everybody back to school. A lot of people back to work, Adam. Yeah, you know, it's that time of year where, Steve, I'm with you. The Christmas lights are still up. I was planning on doing it yesterday, but no, yeah. didn't happen. Nah. No rush. What's the rush? I like the tree in the middle of this, the room, you know, so <laughs> there we go. Yeah, and it's comfortable temperatures out there. It's it's agreeable. Some coolish mornings with temperatures in the 40s to near 50 degrees and then afternoons well into the 70s. What I want to focus on first is our chance for rain, right? Nothing until we get into this upcoming weekend, particularly Saturday night and then the first half of Sunday. Right now we've got it up to 40%, so the scattered category, scattered across the KSAT 12 viewing area. And this evening, in terms of our overall weather pattern, we had some nice clouds roll overhead just in time for sunset. A few photos are now coming in. Here's one from Skywatcher. Woodlawn Lake Park, always a good vista, good vantage point for these sunsets. And we'll continue to probably get a few more photos with even a little bit more color as the evening wears on. And of course, duck set. <laughs> they always have so many ducks there at the park and capture that one nicely. So we'd have some of those clouds rolling in from the west. Again, I love them at sunrise and sunset. 
They give you the nice colorful evenings and mornings. And the big picture though shows a big wound up system with severe thunderstorms in the southeastern US and then snow all the way up north into the Minnesota upper Pen peninsula of Michigan. This big wound up upper level low pressure system cold front passed through our area recently giving us the drier air, the less humid air. And as we go forward, we're going to see more systems, one in particular slamming the west coast over the next few days. And then part of that kind of peeling off and coming our way and that's going to give us our next chance for a few showers and thunderstorms, which isn't until this upcoming weekend. Here's our future cast and it's still pretty far out for a future cast, but I want to share it with you just to give you a general idea of what you can expect Saturday night in particular and early Sunday morning is when we have our best chance and that's at, at about 40% right now. And of course we'll be fine tuning and uh, basically adjusting this forecast a little bit more as we get more information in the days ahead. But all in all, we could see a little bit of a drought denter here coming up this upcoming weekend. Speaking of drought, here's the current situation. Worst drought in most of Texas is right here in northern Bear County, and especially you get up into Comal County, Kendall County, Eastern Kerr County, that dark red. That's the extreme and exceptional drought category. The rest of the state, we have a few pockets of it, but it's really concentrated mostly right here. So we'll take what we can get 72 right now. Dew point of 36 feeling that drier air with that northwesterly wind at eight miles per hour. Dew points, by the way, in the 30s across the board and you look at the trend going forward. We're going to maintain this lack of humidity, which means cooler nights and mornings, but then a quick warm up at the afternoon. We're going to maintain that until Saturday. Saturday, that's when the dew point gets back into the 60s and you'll feel the stickiness and mugginess return very briefly. Just basically one day you'll feel the humidity and that's on um, on Saturday ahead of the next week cold front temperature wise tomorrow morning. This is what you can expect 46 in San Antonio, 46 in Utopia, pretty much everywhere between about 44 and 48 degrees in the morning. By the noon hour, we'll have bright sunshine. We'll make it up to 68 and then a high temperature of 75 degrees. So from the 40s in the morning to the 70s in the afternoon, it's that time of year we see that big temperature spread with the cool mornings and the comfortable afternoon. 73 hello to tomorrow afternoon in Floresville and Pleasanton up to 78 for the high and our high temperatures will drop off a little bit. We have that scattered shower activity and even if you thunderstorm Saturday night, first part of Sunday and Sunday is looking like a bit of a temperature drop, but closer to average for this time of year down to 64. Still no freeze again in sight. All right. Thank you, Adam. All right, we've seen tributes really playing out to this injured football player throughout the country, but especially in Cincinnati and Buffalo after he collapsed during Monday Night Football. Last it's just a horrifying scene, and the debate is raging on right now whether or not to play the game. But yeah. at that same time, our prayers are with DeMar Hamlin and his family right now. We'll have the latest on his condition and also a statement from the Buffalo Bills. And TCU may have lost a Big 12 title, but now they're playing for a national title. <laughs> Coming up. Football coverage powered by Davis Law Firm. Buffalo Bills safety DeMar Hamlin suffered a cardiac arrest after he was hit in the chest while tackling the Bengals' T. Higgins during the first quarter of Monday night's football game between Buffalo and Cincinnati. After making the tackle, Hamlin stood for just a moment before he collapsed on the field. A team of medical personnel from the team and paramedics on hand were able to restore his heartbeat on the field before he was transported by ambulance to a nearby trauma one hospital where he was sedated and listed in critical condition. The game was at first suspended with stunned players and coaches staffs retreating to their respective locker rooms before the decision was made to postpone the game. There was talk of resuming the game after a five minute warm up period, but clearly the gravity of the life threatening situation would not allow that to happen. Here's what the Bills had to say in a statement released today, and it read in total DeMar Hamlin suffered a cardiac arrest following a hit in the Buffalo Bills game versus Cincinnati Bengals. His heartbeat was restored on the field. He was transferred to the University of Cincinnati Medical Center for further testing and treatment. He is currently sedated and listed in critical condition. The TCU Horn Frog to win back to back national titles since Alabama did it in 2011 and 2012. TCU head coach is Sonny Dykes, son of former Hall of Fame coach Spike Dykes. Sonny was asked what advice would his father give to him? Dance with who brung you? <laughs> you know what I mean? I think he would give me the old Darrell Oil quote. I mean, look, just do what you've done. You know, it's worked, got you here. 
And so just keep uh, keep doing what you're doing and be the same person. I think that's going to be our message to our players is, look, we don't have to do anything different than what we've done. If we execute at a high level, then uh, things will be just fine. All right, kick off on Monday night in SoFi Stadium is set for 6.30 p.m. The All-American Bowl featuring the country's top high school football players will be held this Saturday in the Alamo Dome at 12 noon. We were able to visit with the West practice today at Trinity University that features Brandeis head coach Charlie Bruce as a wide receivers coach and Texas A&M commit Colton Thomason out of Smithson Valley. It's amazing, you know, especially with it being in my city, you know, going and uh, putting on for Smithson Valley and the community and the city. It's just, it's an honor. This is a blessed opportunity for me. I get to coach with some amazing coaches all over the, the country and also some amazing players. All right, the All-American Bowl kicks off at noon on Saturday, followed by the San Antonio Sports High School All-Star Game presented by HEB. Our San Antonio Spurs remain in New York City after their loss to the Nets in Brooklyn last night. That's after a disastrous first half in which the Spurs were outscored 74 to 47. Kyrie Irving was able to score on his first seven shots and then brought the Nets bench to their feet with this follow slam and it was downhill from there for Brooklyn. Irving would finish with 27 on the night. Right behind him, Kevin Durant with 25, extending their league leading win streak to 12. The Spurs are led by Keldon Johnson with 22, one of only two starters in double figures. They included Devin Vassell who had 14 in his first game back and missing the last two with knee soreness and the 139 to 103 blowout loss. Next game, they'll just kind of cool their heels in the Big Apple because they take on the Knicks tomorrow night, 630 in Madison Square Garden. So they get four days in New York City. Hopefully they get at least one win out of this trip. Yeah, yeah that'd be nice. Yeah, because mm -hmm. last night was not, not, not good at all. Yeah. No, thanks, Greg. Our KSAT Q&A is up next. It was thought this would be a pretty routine day in the House of Representatives. A Speaker of the House would be elected. The, swearing, the swearing-in ceremony would happen with the new members of Congress. It has been anything but, though. Three votes that did not go House former minority leader no Kevin McCarthy's way. So we're joined by Joaquin Castro live from Washington, D.C. Of course, he represents the 20th congressional district here in San Antonio. Uh, Representative, thank you for joining us. How would you describe what happened today? Uh, on the one hand, historic, but also uh, very chaotic and in many ways sad. Um, the first day of the House of Representatives is usually a lot of perk pop and circumstances. Um, it's people having their family over, their friends for celebrations, uh, people being sworn in, obviously, first time members of Congress. And so this situation has not happened in 100 years where a speaker has not been elected on the first day. Uh, and we've been through three votes now where Kevin McCarthy has failed uh, to get a majority to become speaker. And I'm not quite sure at this point who Republicans, if they're going to abandon him as their candidate, the majority, you know, the lion's share of them, or they're going to go to somebody else at this point. Truly, this has not happened in 100 years, since 1923. That's the last time right. that the election of a House Speaker went to multiple ballots. So talk about what can happen from here. The House adjourned today will be convening again tomorrow. But what are the next steps for the newly sworn in Congress while we wait for the selection? Or are there any steps that can be taken? Well, the interesting thing is that this is the first item of business that the House of Representatives has to undertake. And so we can't do anything else. We can't uh, vote on any bills. We can't make committee assignments, uh, anything until a speaker is elected to preside over the House of Representatives. So it, it leaves the body, the legislative body, in a kind of limbo. Uh, and that, that's what makes it so chaotic is that you're basically in limbo until a speaker is elected. So let's let's talk about, you know, what happens when eventually a speaker is elected. I mean, you're in a much different position than you were, you know, just a month ago. I mean, the, right. the, instead of the majority, you are now in the minority. What are some of the things that you want to see done by this Congress? And are you optimistic that bipartisanship which has been a dirty word for so long, can be accomplished? You know, I'm hopeful, uh, Steve. Um, yeah, I served five terms in the Texas state legislature, and I'm now in my sixth term in the U.S. House of Representatives. Uh, and I've been able to work across the aisle with folks on many different bills and pieces of legislation. 
but the Congress itself has been very gridlocked. Um, you know, divided government gives you a chance for both sides to come together and try to find compromise on the big issues that are affecting San Antonians and affecting all Americans, whether it's rising inflation, uh, rising home prices, uh, the immigration issue and border security, uh, the cost of health care, a lot of things. But, you know, part of the challenge that we have right now is that uh, the Republican Party is really at war with itself. And, uh, you know, it's, it's moved to the right since Donald Trump became president and afterward in this Trump era, I would say. Uh, but even then, you've got this very intense fight going on among Republicans about the direction of their party. And so, you know, I don't know at this point who would be on their side of the table if we're negotiating on these big issues. Uh, it literally is impossible to say at this point. You know, a lot of people would say, well, of course, you as a Democratic politician, not unusual to hear criticism of the Republican Party, but you have served in several different Congresses. This is a unique situation that we're seeing with this obviously very divisive election of a House Speaker. So do you think that that chaos that you've described, does that give you any indication about what progress you think might be made once Congress does get up and running? Well, I can say this. It depends where Republicans go from here. Uh, if they end up with a speaker who's even further to the right than Kevin McCarthy, who's already moved very far to the right, but if they get a Matt Gates, a Majority Taylor Greene, uh, Andy Biggs, one of these folks um, who really came along during the Trump era and are scorched earth politicians, then it's going to be very tough, I think, to find common ground with those folks. I mean, I think at that point, even Republicans won't even be able to find common ground among themselves. Um, so it, it really just depends where they go, you know? And I spent 10 years in the Texas legislature where you had this, this long held spirit of bipartisanship and there were even members of the minority party, whether it was Republicans or Democrats at the time, who were able to be chairs of committees. You know, that kind of bipartisanship in Washington, uh, unfortunately has been unthinkable. I mean, it's just a very different tradition. It's kind of a winner take all. Uh, it's a it's a free for all fighting tradition that's very different um, it, than what I experienced in Texas. Uh, I want to talk immigration, border security. You know, we can even talk Title 42 if you want. But I mean, sure. it is a very part of the reason that uh, this that Kevin McCarthy is having trouble being elected to House Speaker is because they have such a slim majority. Uh, you know, he basically needs all but six Republicans to vote with him is my understanding. And he's not getting that. Democrats are holding firm and, and voting for Hakeem Jeffries in this whole thing. Does that help give Democrats maybe a little more power than they normally would have to deal with things like border security? Are there Republicans that will work with Democrats on something like border security, immigration, things like that? Uh, yeah, I mean, look, we passed as Democrats uh, within the last month, we passed about two billion dollars. My son's peeking into the shot here. Uh, we passed about two billion dollars in funds uh, to help process folks as Title 42 was coming to the end and to buffer border security. You know, and so we have tried to take action uh, as cities like Del Rio and McAllen and El Paso and San Antonio have asked the federal government for help. In, in dealing with the folks who are seeking asylum. Um, and so we're gonna continue trying to work in a productive way uh, among ourselves, but also hopefully with the Republican Party in the House and in the Senate. You know, while, while the selection of a House Speaker is very much in limbo, so is the future of Title 42. That's something we keep talking about. So when, if and when that does come to an end, are there any resources or that aid you mentioned, things that you want to see some of these border towns, border cities get in order to help them with what's expected to be an incredible influx of people coming across the border? Yeah, um, first, I want to make sure that all of our border towns are well taken care of in terms of having the resources they need to get people on their way. So it's not just a city government like San Antonio. As you all know, San Antonio set up a migrant resource center um, that really has become a model for other cities that are dealing with this situation. Uh, but also for a lot of the support organizations like Catholic Charities, for example, that has helped uh, countless 
migrants who are seeking asylum in the United States, get them on their way to most of a lot of them are meeting up with family members in other cities, whether it's on the West Coast or the East Coast. So even as they're moving through Del Rio or San Antonio, the lion's share of them are not staying there. They're moving somewhere else. But there's a process in getting them to where they're going. So I absolutely believe that we got to do everything we can to help our Texas cities get the funds they need to do that. All right, Congressman, before I let you go, if your son's still there, <laughs> give him some camera time right now. Let him come on camera. And I want to ask you what you well, expect to happen tomorrow. Well, my son, my wife, like, got him back into the bedroom over there. Oh, while okay, I all right, all right. Uh, <laughs> but, but look, I mean, for the sake of the country, I hope that, uh, that the Congress at the House will elect a speaker and that we can start governing um, and working on legislation for the good of the American people and for the good of San Antonio. All right, we'll see what happens tomorrow. Congressman Joaquin Castro, thank you so much for sharing some time with us. Give our best to your family that came up to watch you get sworn in again. I'm sure that they were like, what's going to happen now, Dad? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I will. Take right. care, y'all. Take, Take care. care. Happy New Year. We'll be right back.